Good morning, Walk Church. How are you today? You got plan B. Pastor Hyten's gone today. Hey, it's good to be here. It always is. Jason, I, I have to say, being here for the last two worship services, you and the team this morning rocked it. We could just pray right now and go home. Amen? That was really, really good stuff. Well, my name is Pastor Dean McQuillan. For those of you who don't know me, my wife and I have been here for the last four years. Matter of fact, four years next month, in the month of July, had the opportunity to meet with Haydn and the visionary team for a couple of hours. That led to eight strategy meetings, eight weeks of strategy meetings, and then we had the launch of Walk Church, which is the reality of what you see here today. Isn't that awesome? Very awesome. Praise the Lord for what he's done here at Walk Church. Well, if you know anything about this ministry, you know we love our community. My wife and I are a part of the greatest ministry here. I just want you to know. We are a part of the greeting team. I get to hang out there with Lothar and Gary, and I can name all of the, the greeters, the, the ladies that come out there with us, Donna, I mean my wife. We get to know all of you people who walk in the door. It's the greatest ministry at Walk. It really is. If you want to get to know your community, join the greeting team, all right? It's a great place to be. Then also, my wife and I are involved in marriage counseling. We've been married 38 years this September, and we love, thank you, thank you. We love to take young couples who are thinking about getting married, reminding them of their responsibilities, marriage partners. We also get to sit down with those who have been married for years and enhance that marriage. It's, it's, it's never where it needs to be, right? And then one of the best ministries of all, really, is discipleship. And that's to be able to sit down with one of you one-on-one -on -one and share with you what took place in your life when you gave your life to Christ. What does it really mean to be saved? What does it mean to be baptized? What does the local church mean to you? How do you deal with sin? What's the judgment seat of Christ? All of those things that you need to know and want to know so that when you have an opportunity to witness to others, you have an educated mind and heart. Here's the biggest issue in life today when it comes to Christianity. We share our Lord with somebody. We tell them what we feel that God is doing in our heart. They ask us one hard question. They embarrass us, and we never open our mouth again. That's why discipleship is so important to equip you with the very rudiments of your faith. Well, if you've been around since Easter Sunday, what's the mantra? Anybody know? Believe the, Believe the hype. Have you plugged in any of that? I've listened to every message. Every one of them was challenging. I've listened to four or five at least twice. One, three times. Because they were that challenging to me. And if you're here this morning and you've been around for the last several weeks, one of my favorite hypes to plug into and the one that gives me the greatest hope is the hype about the resurrection. Do you realize that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ separates us from every religion in the world? We serve a risen Savior. We're the only ones who can say that. We're not a religion. We don't have a, a, a religious community. What we have, we have a relationship, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he rose again, guess what? You can too. And if you're here this morning and you don't know what that means, I hope today that you leave here knowing exactly what it means to bow before God and say, Lord, I am a sinner. Without you, I have no hope. Lord, the Bible says if I believe in my heart and if I confess with my mouth, thou shalt be saved. And if you were able to do that with a pure heart, God will save you. And then you have the forward thinking and opportunity to be one day a part of the resurrection. And we live with him forever and forever and forever. One of my favorite places to go is Huntington Beach. And when I go there, I like to pick up a granular of sand, a grain of sand, and put it in the palm of my hand. And then I look all the way to the south. I look all the way to the north, and all I see is sand. And you realize that that's just a speck of all the beaches in the world today. But do you realize you could count all of those specks of sand if you had the time to do it? There's a finite number. Eternity is forever. It's forever and forever. 
And when you get tired of forever, it goes on forever and forever more. That's why what we do is so important here at Walk Church. It's a life and death situation spiritually. It really is. Where will you spend eternity? Well, the resurrection shows you the power of what you can have through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we learn the hype about the Holy Spirit. Remember that one. The Holy Spirit of God, when we take and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, what does he do? He takes up permanent residency inside of us, and he empowers us. And he empowers us to do things that we never thought we could do. He uses you the way he has gifted you or will gift you as you start walking with him. It's hard to believe for some of those that I've known for a long time, but in eighth grade, I flunked speech. It's not because I gave a bad speech. It's because I refused to give a speech at all. I was that shy, that withdrawn, and God saved me and said, I have a message for you. I have a message for you to save. And that takes us to the third hype that we plugged into. Believe the hype about your witness. You are a walking witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the body. We're his mouth. We're his arms. We're his legs. He wants you to be a witness with your lips. He wants you to be a witness with your life. He wants it to be favorable to what he has done in your life so other people say, there's something different about that person. Give me a double portion. That's why I got saved. It wasn't because somebody told me and talked me into Christianity. You know why I got saved? I finally met a Christian who was living the life, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. They had a witness with their lips. They had a witness with their life. And then that brings us to one other hype that really challenged me. This is the one I listened to three different times. Believe the hype about prayer. That's a powerful thing. Do you realize that we, at any given time, night, or day, can talk to the creator of this universe? And he listens to you? And he listens to me? But yet, when I find myself in prayer, I'm embarrassed at many of my prayer meetings with the Lord because I'm like a cat. Have you ever seen a cat, and you have one of those little lasers, and you put it on a wall, and they're jumping all over the place for it? They're so easily distracted. I can be five minutes into prayer and really having some good times with God, and then all of a sudden I'm thinking about what I'm going to do the rest of the day. Anybody else? Oh, I get distracted. And if there's anything that hopefully today you will see is to put an end to that distraction when it comes to your intentional time with your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ. So that brings us to the mantra that I have for you today. Believe the hype. That Jesus is the real deal. Jesus. You're going to find today that I don't have very many slides to share. I don't have three points in a poem today. I don't have any type of quotation from a famous preacher. I don't have any notes on the, on the screen as far as commentaries about a particular book. What I'm going to share with you today are the words of Jesus, okay? Okay. I just want to share the word of Jesus today. Jesus and Jesus alone will change your life. So I want us to all take our Bibles this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28. If you're here today and you have your Bible, it's a great thing because I'm going to be going through my Bible on my phone during the message to show you some things that God has shown me. I don't have time to put them all on a screen for you to see, but this will challenge you. I remember when I first got saved 38 years ago, we didn't have screens like this. All we had was our Bible. That's all we had. It's the only way we could follow along. And when we were looking for a church, a good church, we'd always see if the people who were walking in had their Bibles in their hand. That's the only way you knew. So today I'm going to challenge you. If you don't have your Bible, do what I've done. I've converted to you version, right? I've got the Bible with me 24-7. And I can go to any type of version in the Bible to see exactly what God's trying to show me. So if you have your phone with you today, go ahead and plug in to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28. And here's what the Bible says from Matthew chapter 7. It says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, we're going to talk about those sayings. The crowds were astonished. Now, it doesn't say crowd, it says crowds. So I got to thinking, 
Lord, what are you showing me here in the, in the open area of the mount that this whole passage is about? It's about the Sermon on the Mount. They're outdoors. Jesus climbs to the top of this mount, and the crowds follow him. The only thing I could think of as a, a former golfer on a collegiate level was to think about my favorite thing to watch on Sunday afternoon during golf season, and that's the Masters. Any golf fans besides me? <laughs> Most people say golf. That's like watching grass grow. Well, well, let me tell you what I'm trying to share with you here. The crowds. See, on a golf course, you have 18 holes. You have 18 tee boxes. Depending on what golfer you want to follow, you are a crowd within the golf course on one of those 18 holes or 18 tee boxes. So what happened was when one of the leaders starts taking command of the tournament, it's, it, it's funny to watch the gallery moving toward that particular person. That's what's happening here with Jesus. Jesus has been living his life in front of these people. He's been saying this and saying that, and now all of a sudden he's going to the top of the mount to give the Sermon on the Mount. And the crowds are now forming along. They want to see, they want to hear what he has to say. And the Bible again says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Who are the scribes of this day? The religious leaders, the religious rhetoric that was coming out of their mouth, the hypocritical rhetoric that these people saw. But something was different when it came to Jesus. So to give you just a little bit more color of what's going on here, I want you now to consider the paraphrased version of the ESV as we go to the message. And this is what the message says. When Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. Going back to the boring game of golf, all right? It's outdoors. There's hundreds, sometimes thousands of people at these major tournaments, especially the Masters. I love to watch the Masters. And invariably, after four days from Thursday to Sunday afternoon, on the 72nd hole, the game, the match, the championship is on the line. And usually you have an elite golfer standing over his putt, looking at a 34, 35, 36 foot putt. He stands over it. Everybody's quiet. You could drop a pin and you would be able to hear the pin drop. I picture the same thing happening when Jesus was preaching. The crowds had formed and it was quiet, perfectly quiet. And you see this putter pull back push through, he sees the butt, he sees the break, he sees the ball rolling into the hole, he holds his putter up, and he goes, boom, and the putt falls in the hole, he wins the championship, and the crowds at a golf course, if you've never been to one of these events, is crazy loud. They burst into applause. This is the picture that God shared with me as I was preparing this week. It says, when Jesus concluded his address, the crowd burst into applause. They had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying. Quite a contrast to their religion teachers. This was the best teaching they had ever heard. Father in heaven, we bow before you here this morning. Lord, we're not here to hear from me, another man, another message. Lord, we're not here to see notes on commentaries or famous preachers. Lord, we're here to hear you, your sayings. Lord, what are these sayings? Lord, what moved these crowds to applause? What moved them to say the greatest teachings they had ever heard? Lord, today, speak to us. Show us from the Sermon on the Mount what you would want us to hear what you would want us to know, what you would have us to apply in our lives. Lord, if we're here today in one or two places, lost and without hope or walking with you out of balance, but maybe, Lord, there's a third one. Maybe there's somebody here today that is in perfect fellowship with you. How awesome that is. Lord, you're calling us today. You're calling us to salvation. Lord, you're calling us to righteousness. Lord, you're calling to use us for your honor and glory. So Lord, use your sermon, your words today to move us 
as when we leave here today and enter into the mission field of Las Vegas, Nevada, that we will be a witness in lip and in life as we share your power, as we share your salvation, as we say you and you only give eternal life. We love you. We thank you for this time. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. These sayings, I want you to hear me. If you look at your Bible in the ESV, you're going to see subpoints that break these sayings up. And what you're going to see are 20 life-giving points for you and I to live by. I say 20 life-giving points because modern-day churches, I always say this, we love as pastors to, to come with our slide decks, and I call it three points in a poem. You know what I'm talking about. We like to have the beginning word kind of match the other three. We kind of like them to rhyme. We like them to, you know, to, to kind of have a, a little cadence to them. And we have our three points on the screen and then our poem, how we analyze that particular word. The beautiful thing about Jesus is this. He's got 20 points here for us this morning to take a look at. We're not going to have time to look at all of them in detail, but my challenge is this. This week, as you have an opportunity to be with God, just you and him, you and the Lord Jesus, hearing his sayings, pray them back to him, journal those out, and see what it won't do in your heart. And I'm going to tell you why that is so important as we go through this. You're going to find when you read Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, all the way through Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, there's 109 verses for the Sermon on the Mount. Of those 109 verses, 105 of them are made up of red letters that make up red words that denote the very words of Jesus. He is speaking to you. The beautiful thing about God's word, when you find yourself intentionally taking time to be with him, when you read those words in red and you see them coming at you and you're saying those out loud, he is speaking to you. And at that moment, you alone. And you're able to speak those back to him. You're able to go back to him and say, Lord, what do you mean by that? How would you have me to plug into that? Here's another thing you're going to find when you look at this particular sermon. In chapter 5, Jesus corrects the scribe in six different verses. He will say something like this. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. You've heard this person say this. You've heard that pastor say that. You've heard your mama say this, all these other things. But Jesus says this. That's what we're going to plug into today. What does Jesus say? So with all of this in thought, all of this that is going on, here is what I want to communicate this morning. With the word of God available to us 24-7, the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount that tells us exactly what's going on with 20 aspects that bring us to righteousness why do we struggle so many times in life? Have you thought about that? I think about that all the time. And again, it comes down to being disciplined. It comes down to being intentional. And if you don't have discipline, and if you're not intentional, we're going to be like the, the waves of the ocean tossed to and fro. And we're never really going to have anything to sink our teeth into. And I say that because we all find ourselves at times where our life is out of balance. And there's nothing worse than driving a car that has four wheels that are out of balance. Have you ever driven a car like that? It's either pulling to the right or it's pulling to the left. Or it's, you know, bouncing all over the place. The steering wheel's doing this. And you can't focus on your driving because your car is a wreck. The same thing sometimes with our life. We can't focus on what God has for us because we have all of these things pulling and pushing us all over the place. And I say that for this reason. Pastors fall into those situations as well. I don't ever want to be a pastor of this church that makes you think that we have it all figured out. One of the things I can say, though, is this. We've been trained, we've been in the Word of God for many, many years so that when we do get off whack, we know exactly where to go. And it's our job, it's our responsibility to share that with those that God brings in as we are discipling you and bringing you and equipping you to, do be, to be able to do the same thing. So the point that I want to make is this. 
Things don't always go our way. And when things don't go our way, have you ever fallen into this thing called a pity party? You know what a pity party is? I love parties. You know, this year we've, we've had two weddings already. we got two more in front of us. Oh, my goodness. I love when I get together with my family at a wedding. What a great party. But I hate a pity party. I hate them. You get all negative. You start feeling sorry for yourself. You get grumpy. You get irritable. You get anxious, don't you? No more patience. Because you're out there focused on what you think is important. And the pity parties come when this happens. You know what you need to do to provide maybe or to do this for your, in your life or that. Whatever your focus might be. And you know what buttons to push. And you know what levers to pull. And all these things that you do on a daily basis is your focus. And when it doesn't work the way you want it to work, all of a sudden you go, wow, what is going on here? What the heck? I'm doing everything I know works and nothing's working. What's going on? And I find myself in this pity party. I find myself feeling sorry, saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then I immediately go right back to what I think is right. right. You ever been there? Yeah. And it's a cycle. And the beautiful thing is you can get out of those cycles. And today I hope you plug into something that really challenged me here a few weeks ago when I was there, okay? One of the things that I, that I love to do when I preach, when I get to preach, and that is to keep it 100. You know, when we first started this church with Hayden and his team four years ago, I got a list of all these new words and phrases. So I love to chop it up, and I love to keep it 100, right? So I love to chop it up with you when I get the chance, and I love to keep it 100. So this morning, I'm just keeping it 100. I just want you to know that we all struggle, that we all find ourselves in these pity parties. We find ourselves in the funk. And we don't have to call ne negative Nancy to know that we're in a dark day. All we have to do is listen to negative Dean's self-talk. And we know exactly where we're at. And it's not a good place. So here is what happened a few weeks ago. You hate to admit it, but I went to my wife of th almost 38 years. I said, honey, you know the situation I'm dealing with? I'm giving it everything I got, and it's just not happening. You know, I'm pushing these buttons and I'm pulling these levers, and it's, and it's just not happening. She stood up. She looked me in the eye, and she said, <laughs> she said, you need to get in the Word of God. You're putting way too much effort into this thing with your own control. Right. You're giving it way too much of your own time. You need to get in the word. You need to be in prayer. And I honored that. My wife, she is the most level-headed, positive encourager I've ever been around. She's in her Bible daily. I see her every day. It's convicting. When I see her in her Bible and journaling and I'm too busy pushing buttons and pulling levers and quickly reading my proverb of the day, quickly say, Lord, bless this day, and then go about doing what I want to do. Is that convicting or what? Here's the point I want you to make. I want to make with you. Do you have that person in your life? Because if you don't, whatever funk you're in, you're going to be in it for a long, long time. you got to be able to go to somebody that you can trust, that you know is your brother, in my case, my, my wife, if you're not married, you're single, you need to find an accountability partner. Sometimes I just need to go to some of the men in my life. There's some things I just need to talk to men about. You know what I'm talking about, men? And I have accountability partners right here that I can go to. One is my brother, Carl. He's going to tell me straight. He's going to look at me and say, dude, you're out of it right now. Your wheel is all over the place. John K is a guy I can go to. Lothar I can go to. I can go to Haydn. I can go to so many of the people here in this church. And they have the ability and the right to say whatever they want to say to me. You know why? Because I have the ability and the right to say whatever I need to say to them. 
It's accountability. And if you don't have that in your life, get it today. Find somebody that you can go to. I love to go to Mark and Brittany, the times that we've had together, to be 100 with each other. And because of those times, we can talk about anything now. And it keeps us accountable. That's the beauty of a community. That's the beauty of this church. So, what did I do? Well, I did exactly what my wife said to do. Get your butt in the Word of God. I go out to my office. I shut the shades. I kneel down. And I'm saying, Lord, please don't let this be a five-minute prayer where my distractions just get the best of me. Lord, I just need to focus on you. Lord, I got to let you know that whatever I'm doing in this situation is not working, and I need you. I need you to intervene. I need you to step in. And probably 15 minutes, man, I'm doing good. I'm about 15 minutes into this prayer without any distractions. And it was like God took a piece of paper. And it was like he wrote on this piece of paper. And while my eyes were closed, kneeling at the couch, I hear... And I immediately knew exactly where I needed to go. That's the power of prayer. Amen. And he took me to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Please turn there. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says, the words of Jesus, not notes of a commentary, not the quotation of a famous preacher. Jesus, words in red. He said, Dean, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I read the Bible like that. You ever read the Bible like that? Put your name in. If not, try it. It'll wake you up. This day it woke me up. Dean, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this crazy stuff that you're trying to control, I'll take care of. That's what he's saying. As the Bible says, and all these things will be added to you. God convicted me. He convicted me. Oh, I had time to read my Proverbs of the day. I had time to read my news. I had time to read about the upcoming NFL. Oh, I love reading about the NFL. I had time for all that stuff. I had time for all my important phone calls. I had time for all my Zoom conferences. I had time for all my emails. But you know what? All that stuff without Christ is in vanity. It's all vanity. I'm doing it for the wrong reason. I'm doing it for my honor and glory. And Jesus had to correct this pastor and said, dude, listen to what your wife had to say. Get yourself in the word. So here's my challenge to you. I want you to hear what I, God laid on my heart. I took and copied the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, all the way through 7, verse 29. I put it in a Word document. I added bullet notes under every verse. And every day, for the last few weeks, I've been reading those verses as Jesus is talking to me, letters in red. And I'm able to say, Lord, thank you. And I'm able to journal back to him, talk back to him in my notes and in my prayer time. It changed me. And my prayer time went from five minutes to 15 minutes not being distracted to literally over an hour. And I do that now day in and day out just to take and finally capture what it means to have real time with my Lord and Savior. Not just the crumbs of the day. When I had time to read my Proverbs of the day and pray this prayer and pray that prayer, when I had time to read the news, when I had time to read my sports page, when I had time to do all those other things, you know what I had left for God? Crumbs. And sometimes nothing. Because at the end of the day, you're spent. At the end of the day, you find yourself spent. Wow. 
I want you to consider with me now the wheel. The wheel that's on the screen. I want you to see this wheel as your life. In my eyes, that's Dean's life. And in Dean's life, I have all these spokes. And all these spokes represent the things that are important to me. Right? My family. My work. My church. My friends. My hobbies. Vacations. Whatever your life, whatever is a part of you, stick in there. That's your life. All right? That's your life. That's my life. But the real question is, what is the hub? What is the hub in your life? Let me tell you what it is. Are you ready? Write this one down. It's whatever you focus on the most. That's your hub. If it's Jesus, praise God. Praise the Lord. But if you were in my situation, like I was here a few weeks ago, guess what the hub was? what I was dealing with. And that became every thought, every morning I woke up, the first thing that came to mind. And it was the last thing that I would take to bed with me in my mind. It consumed me. And it's a weak center. It's a false hope. There's no hope in what you put your focus on. If it's not the Lord Jesus, your life is out of whack. Look at the spokes. Maybe it's a bad relationship. I don't know what it is, but let Jesus take you to the place to correct it. And that's where I want you to take your Bibles now, and I want you to consider with me the 20 points that we find in the Sermon on the Mount. And then we'll be done. We're going to go right to the point. We're going to say, Jesus, what would you have us to do? I'm opening up my phone right now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And one of my favorite verses now that I really never concerned or or, or really conceived into my heart is now real. And you know what that is? It starts with the Beatitudes. See the list, the 20 list, the 20 points that Jesus wants you to see? In my ESV, the subtitles throughout the whole sermon, you'll find 20 points. Life-changing points for your life. And going back to the wheel for a moment, when you look at the wheel and you get these 20 points right, that hub will become Jesus Christ. And when it is him, oh my, let me give you the results of what's happened in my life after I have focused on this sermon now for the last few weeks. It says in chapter 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You know what's happened with me as I've been in this study and and this prayer time with God? You know what he's done? He's allowed me to get a glimpse of really what it means to have a pure heart. And when you have a pure heart, you can see the things that he sees. I don't want to love the things I love. I want to love the things that he loves and what he has for me. Every time I think I need to have this, God goes, no, you need that. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. So how cool is it to be able to get along with God and for the first time see the blessings of a pure heart that sees the things that God sees? Let's continue. He talks here, the second point, salt and light. Look what we see here in verse 14. He says, Dean, you are the light of the world. You are. You're the light of the world, a city Set on a hill cannot be hidden. That's your witness. He wants you to be lit up. And we can't be lit up when we're focused on our own issues, right? Now look what he says in verse 16. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Point number three. Again, we don't have time to look at every verse here, but hopefully you'll be challenged to do something different this week. And I can't wait to talk to some of you next week and say, wow, this is what Jesus did in my heart this week as I just got alone with him. I wasn't reading about the Bible. I was reading the Bible. 
You know what happens with modern Christianity? We love to read books about the Bible. We love to read books about Jesus. We love to read books about Christianity. Read the Bible. Just read the Bible, and God will show you these things. He didn't come, he, or it says here, Christ came to fulfill the law. Do not think that the Old Testament is just a bunch of, you know, old dusty fables. God puts it all together. Do you realize that God has broken that Bible up for you to understand it in three different ways? It was written to the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. It was written historically, doctrinally, and inspirationally. And he wants to be able to put all that together. And Jesus came to fulfill all of that. That's the beautiful thing about that point. Anger. Let's talk about anger for a moment. No, let's please don't. Our world is whacked right now with anger. Look at what's going on in our world today. Look at the stupid stuff we read or see on the news every night. It's depressing. And most of them is because of this thing called anger. This is where Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say. You can have anger that leads to murder, even in your heart. Wow. My brother-in-law we were talking the other day, and it's a, it's a great saying that he shared with me. Anger and bitterness. You know what it's like when you have anger and bitter towards somebody? It's like you drinking a bottle of poison and hoping they die. Because that bitterness is killing you. And they may not even know you're going through that. You're the one that's being affected in a negative way. Let's continue. The 20 points that Jesus wants you to see. The lust issue. Lust is a big issue in our world today. Look what it says. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm just going to share with you my age for a minute. When I was a kid and we wanted to go and get the girly magazines, it was an embarrassment. You wouldn't ask for them because they knew who you were, but not today. A click here and a click there, you can go wherever you want. And it's destroying our society. It's, it's changing our men. Right. It's changing our men. And I'm not just picking on the, on the men. I'm sure ladies deal with the same thing as well, but primarily the man God is talking to here. It's a mess. And Jesus says, let's get this thing right. These are the words of the Lord Jesus. He continues, divorce. Dorlisa and I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of those that we've dealt with in, in marriage. This is a tough passage. I don't understand all of it. But I will say this. God is a God of reconciliation. He hates divorce. Work it out. Work it out and see what God will do if you put him first. Make him the center. How about an oath? Look at chapter 5 and verse 37. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Be a man that has conviction. Be a woman who has conviction. Don't be a yes man. Don't go with the crowd. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So many of us make a decision, and then when we see the multitude go another way, we go, oh, okay, I'll go that way too. You see what I'm talking about? Stand up for your convictions. Retaliation. That's a good one. Look at verse 38, 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. <laughs> That's a tough verse. Amen? Amen? It's a tough verse. Love your enemies. Look at verse 44. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Are you kidding me? That's what Jesus says. Tough stuff. Look at chapter 6. I love chapter 6 where he says, given to the needy. Beware of practicing righteousness before other people. Don't be a show off. Some of the versions I love when you're reading this with this, this uh, Sermon on the Mount. And whenever you find a verse that talks about people who want to be seen like in, during their prayer time, he calls them show-offs. 
Don't be a show off. Who cares what others think? What does Jesus think? That's what you should be worried about. The Lord's Prayer. Again, I've already confessed, this is a tough one. And it says in verse 7, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I don't want to offend here, but I want to say this loud and clear. You know why it's so hard sometimes to go to a prayer meeting? And we put a lot of emphasis on our prayer meeting. It comes up every Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month. But you know why it's sometimes so hard? Some of these people just like to hear themselves talk. I don't say that to be mean. I just say that to be honest. Don't be all flowery. Just get to the point. Jesus wants to hear what your heart's about. Don't try to sound all cool. Christianese. Christianese prayers are, uh, they make me want to vomit. They just like to hear themselves talk. And again, I don't want to be mean when I say that, but get to the point. And Jesus says this. Pray then like this. This is not what he wants you to pray, vain words over and over and over and over and over again. As he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know what he's saying? Get to the point. If you got an issue and you're not right with somebody, just say, Lord, I'm not right with somebody. You're going to have to help me with this one. Lord, I'm trying to control this situation. I need you to help me put that aside and give it to you. Seek ye first, Dean, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those things that you're trying to control, I'll take care of you, buddy. I'll take care of you. I'll find a way that you will see me in this thing. Fasting's a tough passage. Laid up treasures in heaven. Do not be anxious. This is what led me to this passage. I found myself worrying. When I'm worried, I am now sinning before my Lord because it's saying, I don't trust you. Don't be anxious. Verse 33 is where God led me to pull this all into context. And then chapter 7. We're really good at this one. Are you ready? Judging others. Aren't we good at that? Man, we we see everybody else to sin. And we think we're just perfect. And he says this in verse 3 of chapter 7. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? When's the last time you read that verse? Pray that one back to Jesus. Wow. Kind of quiet today, isn't it? See, when you're talking to the, the God of this universe, when you're talking to the Savior of humanity, and he's talking back to you, it's hard to debate it, isn't it? God just wants us to fall to our knees and say, Lord, you're, you're God and I'm not. Study to be quiet. Lord, help me to pray. The golden rule. You know what we're missing in our society today? We're missing kindness. We just, we just lack kindness. Just be kind. Don't be abrupt. Just be kind. I hate when I'm like that. The golden rule says this in verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Well, they didn't come and see me in the hospital last week. Well, how about the first three months prior to when you were in the hospital and those 12 people were in the hospital? Did you go visit them? You see what I'm talking about? Let's treat others how we want to be treated. Let's treat them the way we want them to treat us. How about the tree and its fruits? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Be careful what you see. Be careful when you go to the Christian bookstores. Those are some of the most dangerous places you can go. Read your Bible. What does Jesus say? And then, of course, he talks about those who are all religious all holier than thou. He says, I never knew you. And then I conclude with Matthew chapter 7. 
Verse 24, build your house on the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. Look what he says. He says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall. Why? Because it had been founded on the rock of Jesus Christ. Who's in your hub? If it's not Jesus, let's put him there today. Amen? Because here's what happens when we don't. And then Jesus drops the mic and the crowd burst into applause. Because he says this. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. There's some great people that I know who have given their lives to Christ, but they've gotten out of whack. They don't have anybody to hold them accountable. And when you do try to hold them accountable, they get mad and they leave. Don't get mad. Surrender. Surrender. After Jesus says these words, look what happens. And when Jesus finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Boom. Jesus dropped the mic. Those were his words. They burst into applause. Why? The words of Jesus Christ. Give it a chance this week. I challenge you. Find yourself under the words of Jesus. Pray them back. Journal to him. Talk to him as somebody who is totally real in your life because he is. Remember what I said this morning? What's the hype? Believe Jesus is the real deal. Jesus is the real deal.